Hi there, I'm Dr. Christian Shorey and this is Climate Questions, the series where we try to answer your climate questions. In this second episode, we're answering the question, what is the evidence for human-induced climate change? It's a very simple, quick question, but the answer does have a lot of complexity and depth. So uh, I try to keep it as quick as possible, so let's get right to it. Now, the evidence, um, I have in my life also been into evolutionary science and um, engaging with the public on that uh, topic as well, and I found some amazing similarities between talking to the public on evolution and talking about climate change. They're both controversial topics. Some people have ideologies that just flat out reject these ideas, and therefore you get a lot of interesting uh, mental workings to get around that. So what I frequently get with uh, you know, people who don't buy into evolution is just give me the one piece of evidence, that one thing that is going to prove to me that evolution is true. I get the same thing with climate. Give me that one piece of evidence that is going to convince me that this is true. And I would say, I can't do that. I can't give you one piece of evidence because both of these uh, branches of science deal with a consensus of evidence coming together from different converging areas and all converging on the same idea. That's what drives the evidence here. If I was forced into a corner and had a gun to my head and said, you tell me the one piece of evidence that climate change is real, I'd just say first law of thermodynamics. You know, if you can't create nor destroy energy. It has to just be transferred from one form to another. We have measured an energy imbalance on this planet. We know energy is being retained. It has to go somewhere. Okay? And then, obviously, the climate system is going to be taking that, that heat in. So uh, that would be my one piece of evidence. But let's get into the consensus. One, we have predictive evidence. Um, we've had models going back to the, you know, Svante Arrhenius in the 1800s, which have had some aspects of them come true. But as we get more and more detailed models, we start to see how well they predict. By 1988, James Hansen testifies to the Congress showing this Earth model that he has constructed. He did Venus first, then he did Earth. And he put everything that he knew about climate systems into this model. And then he tried to retrodict the past. The black line is actual global average temperature, whereas the purple, green, and blue lines are his th three, three model runs here. And it looks like he's doing a pretty good job modeling the past climate up to 1988 when he does, does this presentation. Then he says to the Congress, my model says if we keep going, well, it depends on what we do. Are we going to cap off our emissions and level it off or, you know, keep CO2 and other greenhouse gases constant? Are we going to keep kind of a middle of the road uh, emissions scenario? Maybe a little bit better than moderate, or like just go full blast and, you know, keep burning business as usual. Uh, and he came out with those three scenarios. He said in that talk he believed that the blue line scenario would probably be most accurate. All right, and there's error bars around all these lines. So um, the line here that I just threw in is a vague idea of where the temperatures have gone since then, and generally they have followed the blue line. Um, if I recall correctly, he had predicted something like a 0.026 degrees Celsius warming per decade for the next few decades. It came out to be 0.02, not 0.026. Um, and he used a slightly larger what we call climate sensitivity in his model. And climate sensitivity is how much will the globe's temperature uh, change with a change in greenhouse gas. And we usually say a doubling of greenhouse gas. If we double CO2, how much would temperature on the planet warm up? The consensus on that idea right now is 3 degrees Celsius. A doubling of CO2 or greenhouse gases tends to cause about 3 degrees Celsius warming. And Hansen was using a slightly larger value. If you go back and plug in the 3C into his model, he pretty much nails it with a blue line. So we were able to look into the future and say, I think this is what is going to happen. And we have uh, other papers from Hansen back in the 80s that just do some amazing prognostication when you look at what's going on today. Uh, you know, the, the shrinking ice sheets and uh, warming oceans. And, uh, so he did nail a lot of what we are observing. So there's predictive side of this. There's also a retrodictive side of this, that when we try to remodel the past, especially now that we've gotten past 1988 and we've got quite a few more data points, and this one only goes up to 1990, um, that starting in the, about the 70s and then mainly in the 80s, we seem to see a divergence 
between models that run only natural causes and those which take in anthropogenic forces. And when you do the anthropogenic versus natural, and then you look at the actual black lines, the actual data, uh, which one of those is the actual data following? It's the anthropogenic one, not the purely natural one. And so we say we believe there's mostly anthropogenic starting in about the 1980s. That's what James Hansen said. He said, I believe that the human influencers will start pulling out from the natural background in about the 1980s. Drew Schindel said the same thing in the 1970s, it'd pull out in the 1980s. Um, the IPCC report on this, the fourth assessment report, asked 30 modelers to try the same thing and then did an ensemble of the 30 models to really see how this statistically pulls together. This is natural only, and you have the red line being actual observed temperatures, whereas the model is uh, just using natural forcers, and it does pretty well on the back side from 1850 to about 1970, but then it just diverges. Right? And if you ask for anthropogenic, it does really well in the uh, 1980 to the present level over here, it does have a little bit of gappiness, 1940 to 1970, but of course you just add everything in natural plus anthropogenic. And we feel like we've got a pretty good handle on something like average global temperature and how we influence it, right? Um, but it's not just average global temperature. I mean, I am more concerned about you know, regional. What's going to happen in this area, the Montane, Colorado area? What's going to happen locally? What's going to happen to the Denver Golden? area with climate change. Um, as you get smaller and smaller scale, it gets harder and harder and harder to get the details. Um, but regional studies have been done, and retrodictive evidence of the anthropogenic signal works in regions, not just for the globe. So we feel like, uh, yeah, there's definitely a human influence in this. Beyond the predictive side and the retrodictive side, we also have fingerprinting evidence. Um, Dr. Ben Santer has been a main thrust in this area, and this one is the prediction that, uh, and this was made back early, like Guy Callender said this in the 1930s, he said, if we keep pumping CO2 in the atmosphere, we should have this greenhouse effect that holds you know, this radiation in, that's trying to escape the Earth, the thermal IR, and most of the capturing happens at night and during winter, when the thermal differential is the greatest. And so, if the greenhouse effect does come on board, we should expect to see temperatures rise, but you should see the cold temperatures rise faster than the warm temperatures. That is, nighttime should warm faster than day, winter should warm faster than uh, summer. And that's basically what this graph says. We're looking mainly at these two middle uh, chart bars here. The minimum temperatures, uh, the models here predicted that it would go up more than the maximum temperatures would go up, and then the observed here, minimums went up substantially more than the, the uh, maximums. So that's a fingerprint that says, yeah, that's what we expected with this kind of warming. Okay. Uh, another fingerprint is that if you're retaining heat in the troposphere, the lowest level of the atmosphere, sorry, up here, then that radiation that's being caught and then radiated back down to the Earth was radiation that used to come up into the next level of the stratosphere. And if you're removing that energy input to the stratosphere, the stratosphere should cool. Now, one of the other uh, main contrarian ideas that I hear a lot is climate change is due to the sun. I hear this a lot. It's the sun, stupid. Come on. <laughs> That's what drives climate. So if there's climate change, it's clearly solar. Every one of these people I've met and discussed with, I've asked the same question. How do you explain that the troposphere is warm and the stratosphere is cool? And I get blank stares every time, and because they can't explain it. The sun should be warming both if it's intensifying. The greenhouse effect should be warming the troposphere, cooling the stratosphere, and that is what we observe. You see some little anomalies here. You see a, a warming spot around Antarctica and the stratosphere. This is about 18 kilometers up. This is about 5 kilometers up, about halfway up the troposphere into the stratosphere. And so we see some little anomalous warming here and even some anomalous cooling in the tropospheric level. This has to do with ozone depletion, some complicated issues of uh, uh, polar vortices, uh, both air and ocean that go around the Antarctic continent. We're going to talk about this a little bit more if I have time. Um, and so there are some little anomalies there that you would expect out of a system like this. 
The overall, though, is quite clear, and though we're kind of caught up with the top here, uh, the Arctic is warming in the troposphere faster than anywhere else. That is another prediction of Guy Calendar back in the 1930s. The Arctic should warm faster than anywhere else on the planet due to the ice and snow feedbacks. Other fingerprinting, we would expect that as you warm the troposphere, the bottom layer, the top of it should rise up higher and higher, puffing up the troposphere as you heat it. And the tropopause is what we call the top of the troposphere. It's been shown to be rising in altitude. Um, we got the oceans. That's one of the other gambits I hear. And that's one that I bought into it for a while. It's like, well, maybe, maybe we're not quite causing this. Maybe it's the oceans. They're a huge heat reservoir. Maybe there's enough dynamics there we don't understand that it could be causing this. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think that way at all anymore. I mean, the oceans are warming. Every ocean basin is showing warming, especially in the top, like, 3,000 meters. Uh, how would you be warming the atmosphere from the ocean if the ocean is also warming? They're both warming. Uh, and that indicates you're getting added energy into the system, not just exchanging energy from one part of the system to another. Right? Uh, and if you want a little bit more, sea level pressure has changed in the way that we predicted it would. Uh, precipitation has changed around the world in a manner that we predicted it would. Uh, take these two right here. Increasing downward long wave radiation has been measured. Decreasing upward long wave radiation has been measured. You put those together and there's my first law of thermodynamics argument. You're retaining heat in the system. It has to go somewhere. Uh, top of the atmosphere is an energy imbalance. It's like putting a pot of water on a stove, right? It doesn't immediately go up to this higher temperature. It takes a little while to equilibrate. And while it's coming to equilibrium, it's out of equilibrium. We have basically put the Earth on a kind of a stove. We've added a, a heat source, an internal feedback heat source with the greenhouse effect. And the Earth is coming up to its equilibrium. Of course, we keep turning the stove up as we keep putting more greenhouse gases in. We've got that issue going, too. Uh, melting of northern sea ice is consistent with prediction, though I do have to say it's melting faster than we had predicted. So there are uncertainties in the models, and I hope you understand that the uncertainties go both ways. <laughs> uh, maybe it's not as bad as we think. Maybe it's worse.